So I decided to pick up a minor in applied economics to combine with my physics major to give me a few more options as to what I could do for a career after graduation, as well as just explore a couple of other academic areas that were of interest to me. So during high school, I competed in Physics Olympiad and was one of the top 10 in state for the Physics Bowl, which is why coming into Cornell, I initially decided that I wanted to major in physics. But going on to some of the more upper level electives in physics, I realized that it became a lot more theoretical than I thought it was going to be. And that to really pursue a career in physics, you would have to seek education at the graduate level. And I really didn't see myself spending another four to five years in college, which is why I decided to leave for industry instead. So adding on the applied economics minor was beneficial to give some more education and applicable skills since physics was very much theoretical. And it definitely gave me a leg up in job recruiting as well as helping me prepare for interviews just by giving me more knowledge of how the broader economy works as well as being able to answer some more specific questions that the physics major was not able to prepare me for. Because for a lot of the interviews that I had for working in finance, they ask you a few more questions that are related to uh, that would be more applicable to an econ major than they would be to a physics major. So the way that you declare a major at Cornell is actually surprisingly straightforward. At Cornell, every freshman starts off as an undeclared major. It doesn't matter whether or not you uh, put an intended major on your college application, you're not necessarily locked into that. After you come in freshman year, you take the prereqs courses for every single major's application form. And then as long as you fill out all of the prereqs, you're able to get into the major for the most part. So Specifically for the physics major, you would need to take the core intro physics sequence, which is mechanics, electricity, magnetism, special relativity, as well as wave and optics, as well as the core math requirements of calculus one, two, and three. Now the intro and the core physics sequence are generally pretty large lectures of a few hundred students. And the first two in the sequence, mechanics and ENM are also required classes for all engineering students. So you're gonna be looking at class sizes of 500 plus, which is fairly large and daunting, but they offer plenty of opportunities for TAs to help, as well as weekly discussion sections, which are pretty valuable. And also since they're introductory courses, they're specifically designed so that it's fairly difficult to fail them and the content, at least if you had a strong high school background in math and science, you're do fairly well in. And for the most part, a lot of kids breeze through it. Now, once it gets to the 300 level, a good amount of students have decided to choose another major and average class sizes are somewhere around 40 students, which is where they say that a lot of students have been sort of weeded out of the major. And at the 400 level, and especially for upper level lab classes, you can expect around 10 to 15 students per class being accompanied by one professor, which has 20 to 30 years of research experience, which is a tremendous opportunity that I don't believe is offered at many other institutions. So, the way that courses work uh, for most STEM classes in university and not just for physics, but for a lot of math and engineering classes as well, is that you will have weekly problem sets as well as two midterms and a final. So going into the physics department at Cornell, I actually had a lot of AP credit, uh, which helped me graduate a semester early. So the physics department gave me credit for AP Physics C Mechanics and ENM, as well as AP Calculus A, B, and B, C, which was fairly helpful because it meant I didn't have to take those intro math and physics classes. You needed a five in those exams to receive credit. And even if you did receive a five, the physics department has a special honors intro sequence for physics majors with AP credit, which was designed because the advanced placement exam for physics is significantly less difficult than the rigor of a standard intro physics class at Cornell. So it's designed to sort of give you uh, a leg up in terms of how well you're prepared later on for the intermediate classes if you already had AP credit going into Cornell. So I can't rave enough about how physics professors at Cornell are. They are absolutely fantastic. Some of the best and most accommodating professors and the most understanding people that I've ever met in my life. They're very passionate about teaching and they're generally more concerned about you learning the content than grades, especially once it gets to upper level classes. That intro courses where it's 400 to 500 people in a class, it'd be a lot more strict following the textbook, following the syllabus. But at upper level courses, there's a lot more flexibility. Like there have been times where I have submitted a problem set a full week late and still receive credit for it because the professor was just more concerned about the fact that I was learning and following along in the class than then he was about the grades that I received, which is also why at the upper level, you see some grade inflation where the median tends to be a B plus or A minus, whereas at the lower levels, it tends to be at around a B minus. So most professors have weekly office hours as well as homework sessions. 
And each teacher assistant, which is usually a grad student in the physics program at Cornell, has office hours twice a week as well. These people will usually be three to four years older than you, and they're very helpful in teaching the material and should be your primary point of contact if you're ever struggling in a class. Professors are also pretty approachable and readily available for individual sessions in addition to office hours and homework uh, sessions if you're really struggling in class because they're generally concerned about you passing. So a lot of the physics professors actually write their own textbooks or class notes in latex. So the quantum mechanics professor at Cornell has published all of his class notes online, which in my opinion are better than any textbook that I've ever read. I highly encourage you to look at them online and it should give you a general idea of the difficulty of courses. If you just search up uh, Thomas Arias Cornell quantum mechanics, you'll be able to see his lecture notes. Now, some of the benefits of majoring in physics at Cornell is that some jobs send out exclusive applications to only physics majors. So a decent amount of data science positions, hedge fund analyst roles and software engineering roles specifically seek out physics majors in order to apply for those positions because they're seen as one of the most rigorous physics programs in the country. Now, when choosing between physics programs, there is actually a lot that went to my mind when choosing it. Cornell had a top five physics program but one of the main reasons that I chose Cornell was for uh, its position in Ithaca, New York. So for people that don't know too much about Ithaca, it is uh, upstate New York, not really too close to any major cities, but has a lot of really beautiful hikes around the area, as well as really pretty scenery and nature literally steps away from your door. Like there will be deer running around on the quad during your freshman year. That's not a completely unusual sight to see. And that combination was something that worked out really well for me since I was a really outdoorsy person that liked going on hikes on the weekend or kayaking trips and still wanted to be able to get that really strong and sort of rigorous physics education that Cornell was able to give. The second reason why I uh, chose Cornell as my top spot for a physics major was because of the way that they structured the major itself. So I recommend anybody uh, when applying to university for a specific major, if that is a major component of your application, you should look at that department's website online in order to get a sense of what the vibe of the major is, any like special type of research that they have, uh, any type of special programs, et cetera, or any type of labs or equipment that are really useful to you that you might want to have. So for example, Cornell has a particle accelerator located underneath their football field, which is something that I think only two or three universities in the United States has. And that's definitely something that you should include in your application and write about because it shows that you did a decent amount of research for that role. Now, for me, the specific reason why I wanted uh, Cornell physics was because of the way that they structured the outside versus inside concentration for the major. So it's a roughly 50-50 split and it's mostly juniors deciding that they don't want to go to grad school for physics, or they don't want to pursue uh, a main career in physics, or they want to explore other academic interests, they can choose to substitute a lot of the upper level electives with upper level electives and another related field. For example, math, computer science, chemistry, biology, econ, et cetera. And the way that this process works is that you have to choose eight credits uh, above the 3000 level and 15 credits total in an adjacent field of physics. And these all have to be signed off on by your major advisor, which in my experience, they're usually pretty lenient and pretty flexible on, as long as the subject that you're choosing to do an outside concentration in is somewhat tangentially related to physics, or you could tell a reason as to why you're interested in that uh, other field, then you could absolutely get all of your outside concentration approved as long as you meet those core requirements. Now, the main reason why you'd want to do an outside concentration is because it significantly lowers the amount of physics classes at the upper level that you're taking, which means that you can explore a lot of other opportunities if you don't decide that you want to delve really deep into physics and get really into the research. Now, if you're somebody that is looking at grad school for physics, there are two things that you should probably do. The first being choosing an inside concentration because it will show that you have a lot of those upper level electives on your class that would be prereqs in order to get into any good grad school program, as well as helping you prepare for the GRE in order to place well into a good grad school program. The second thing that you absolutely need to do is to get a research position on campus, which sounds fairly hard, but it's actually surprisingly not that difficult to do as long as you keep on trying at it. There are two methods with which you secure a research position on campus. The first being by cold emailing professors, 
you search up different professors on Cornell's website, find out the research that they're doing and what their lab is about, and then write an email to them explaining your interest in the lab and whether or not they were to have an open spot for you to be working or in their lab in any capacity. Now, generally you send these emails out around your sophomore year, uh, but the easiest way to get a guaranteed position in a lab is to take a class that the professor is teaching, go to every office hour, develop a type of repertoire of the professor, as well as, of course, doing well in the class and demonstrating that you have intellectual passion and an interest in the subject. And then at the end of the semester, emailing the professor and asking if they have any research positions open, and they're most likely help you get something in their lab. So that's the general gist of how the physics major at Cornell works, as well as the opportunities afterwards. I chose to do an outside concentration in economics and we'll be working in debt capital markets after graduation. So that's also another fairly common field that people go into with the physics major, working in financial services. You can work for a variety of quant funds as well as other corporate investment banking roles which is a completely different uh, video lecture series entirely, which I'll be doing next.